Well, thank you guys so much for coming today. Uh, my name is Tini Wichardi. I am the education reporter with the Denver Post. I hope everybody had a safe and warm weekend. And if you are joining us today on our snow day, I wanna thank you guys so much. We are here today to talk about something super important to Colorado schools, which is the Colorado Measures of Academic Success or CMAS, which has been a really hot topic this school year in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. So today we're here to dive into the pros and cons of standardized testing, what's happening in our Colorado legislature and much, much more. But before we do, um, in addition to thank you guys for being here, I just wanna give you a heads up that we will have time at the end of our discussion to take questions from the audience. So if you have any burning questions about CMAS, feel free to drop them in the chat and we will get to those after our panelists. Um, and now I would like to introduce those people who are here chatting about this important subject today. So when I see your name, feel free to come off mute and say a few words about yourself and why you have a special interest in this subject. So first we'll start with Stephanie Perez Carrillo with the Colorado Children's Campaign. Stephanie also served on the Department of Education's COVID-19 stakeholders group. So she has some interesting insight there. Stephanie, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks so much, I appreciate it. Uh, I work as the policy and partnerships manager at the Colorado Children's Campaign. As you mentioned the organization earlier and we advocate for data-driven public policies that improve child well-being and health, education and early childhood. Awesome. Next up is Rob Steen, superintendent of Roaring Fork Schools. Rob Stein, hi. Um, yeah, Rob superintendent Stein. of the Roaring, that's okay, the Roaring Fork Schools. So we're on the Western Slope of Colorado. We have about 6,000 students in three communities, Glenwood Springs, Basalt, and Carbondale. Um, our, we have a very bilingual bicultural community, about exactly 50% of our students live in Spanish speaking households. Um, and the rest live in English speaking households. So that's sort of how, what characterizes our student population and a lot of the other issues related to that. I wanna say, I grew up um, reading books from the tattered cover. When I was a kid, I would ride my bike over to the Cherry Creek store um, years and years and years ago when it was a little storefront on second or third Avenue. Fantastic. Awesome. Dr. Cynthia Trinidad Sheehan with the Colorado Association for Bilingual Education. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Cynthia Trinidad Sheehan. I am an advocate and a member of the Colorado Association of Bilingual Ed Advocacy Committee. I'm a native of Colorado, uh, 20 years of experience in education. I've had every position in education. I've been a paraprofessional, a teacher, a building administrator, and district level administrator. And that's why I have such a big interest in this topic. Presently, I'm the principal at New America School Lowry, which is a charter school through the Charter School Institute. We're an alternative high school. Our mission is to support students who are refugee immigrants and students who have been underserved in the traditional surrounding high schools. And so that is why I'm here today. Um, and my doctorate is a focus on equity. Fantastic. Next up. Lori Shepard, Distinguished Professor and Dean Emerita at CU Boulder, who spent decades researching standardized testing. Tell us a little bit about it. Uh, yes, yeah, so in addition to studying the effects of high stakes testing, I've also spent uh, 20 years doing research on uh, formative assessment in classrooms, which is quite different from high stakes testing. And for this conversation, it's relevant that since 1995, I have done research for the National Assessment of Educational Progress uh, that produces the nation's report card. Fantastic. Amy Baco Alert is president of the Colorado Education Association, which is the state's largest union of educators. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you for having me today. I'm Amy Baca Olert. I am a high school counselor serving as president of the Colorado Education Association. The CEA represents over 39,000 educators across the state of Colorado. So I'm very proud to serve as the president. And probably my most important job is that I am a mom to a third grader, a fourth grader, and a sixth grader who all attend our public schools here in Colorado. Awesome. We have a couple other parents with us today. Clark Burton is a parent to three young sons, but he's also a teacher in Erie, Colorado. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And yeah, I'm coming at this with a dual perspective uh, as a parent of a third grader and a kindergartner 
and then uh, also as a high school social studies teacher and especially uh, I teach government. So the, the aspect of this that we're looking at uh, some legislative bills uh, to make this all happen is uh, interesting to me as a government guy. Absolutely. And our last panelist, but certainly not least, Katie Winner. She's also a parent with some students in middle school around here. Thanks so much, Tanya. Hey, everyone. Pleasure to be here. My name is Katie Winner. I'm a transplant from New York. Um, I am a parent of two. I have a fifth grader um, in elementary school and a rising high school freshman, which I cannot believe. Time flies when you're having fun. In a prior life, I worked <laughs> in higher education, um, everything besides teaching um, on the student affairs side of the house. And I'm just a geek for uh, you know good, in, good community conversation about really interesting issues. So thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you again to all of our panelists. This is a hugely important topic to Colorado, especially as we get up against sort of the deadline for when standardized testing starts. Rob, I wanna start with you. Can you give us a little bit of background about CMAS? What are the benefits of the standardized test during a typical school year? And how, if at all, have those conversations and perspectives changed in light of COVID? You know, I think if we were to design an assessment system, we would not be where we are today. Um, what I see is the benefits, and I'm also not going to be a spokesperson for CMAS or, or, or what, you know, what that program is intended to do. Um, as an educator, I would like to know what my kids are learning and what they aren't learning. I'd like to be able to find spots, bright spots, where um, schools and, and um, groups of students are doing well and to look more deeply at why. I'd like to be able to monitor progress over time. And I think that the CMAS program was designed partly with that intention, but it's very corrupted by accountability. Some people would say the purpose of our standardized testing system is to measure in grade schools or measure in grade teachers. And that has corrupted the system and made it worse, um, not better in my view. So what I'd love to see is a system where we can get good data, especially in this time when we have one of the largest involuntary education experiments we've ever seen on what's worked through this pandemic and what hasn't. And so my hope would be that we can capture anything remaining of CMAS for that use, um, but I'm not holding that hope at this point. Interesting. Yeah, originally Colorado lawmakers wanted to cancel CMAS testing outright, but Governor Jared Polis was not on board with that. And the Biden administration last month said it expected states to issue standardized tests. And now there's a new bill that's passed both the House and Senate um, in our Colorado legislature that would limit CMAS to one subject per grade level, of course, contingent on a waiver from the federal government. Specifically, students would take either math or literacy. Um, Stephanie and Cynthia, do you guys agree with what's in this bill? And I'm curious, what do you expect the impact to be on students? Whomever wants okay, to, go like to go first. Or I, I'm happy to go first. Okay, <laughs> since I'm off mute, I'm happy to do it. So, you know, you mentioned earlier when we started the webinar that I served on the COVID implication stakeholder work group and that group was convened by the commissioner of education uh, last fall. We met for over 25 hours to talk about some of these pieces and, um, you know, Amy and I have had some impassioned conversations in, in that work group. Um, and I think part of what was recommended was that we acknowledge that this is just a bizarre year for everyone, for students, for educators, for administrators. And I think um, that group came to consensus on a lot of pieces around accountability, educator evaluation. And the piece where we had a lot of conversation was around CMAS. Uh, what made sense to ask of educators? What made sense to ask of students? And I think part of what was really hard and is still really hard is what Rob mentioned is that we don't exactly know what kids are and aren't learning. I think we keep on hearing um, the tales of learning loss and we keep on hearing that there's inequities within our systems and within learning, but we can substantiate those claims without data to show that. To show that. And so we, the legislation that was introduced, um, House Bill 1125, didn't necessarily align with, with some of the recommendations that came out of the COVID stakeholder work group, but we think 1161 accomplishes what we, we as the children's campaign we're hoping for, we're hoping for, especially as members of the COVID implication stakeholder work group, to understand at a base level, what do kids understand in ELA? What do kids understand in math after this year that has felt like an experiment? And I think one of the biggest challenges has been, how do we reframe assessments in a way where we're talking about it as educational census, as opposed to high stakes, which I think is what most parents and most um, students say they feel about the assessment. Um, and so I think the impact on students can't be um, 
it's not a universal impact. And I don't think I'm, I'm comfortable making blanket statements about the impact it'll have on students. But I do know that it will give parents and students alike an opportunity to understand more holistically what they did and didn't learn this year. And so it, it paints a more complete picture for both parents and students to understand what happened in this last year. All right, thank you, Stephanie. So if we wanna know what teacher, what the students have learned, let's ask the teachers. As an administrator, I am still in the classrooms. I'm not in the physical classrooms, but I'm in the Google classrooms. I still do observations. I still observe learning. I still observe great instruction. And I think that if we wanna know what the students are learning, then let's ask the experts. We have experts with those students every single day and they're called teachers. And our teachers not only plan lessons, but they assess those students every day. They have to assess them in order to know how to plan the next day's lessons. And even in the Google Classroom, they can break out kids into breakout rooms and they are still doing group work and they're still doing projects. And our teachers are still working very hard to make sure that our students are having great instruction every day. So if we want to know what our students are learning, then we should ask our teachers. And parents are still having parent-teacher conferences and they're still able to have those conversations with our teachers. So when we say that, you know, when I'm hearing that this bill is going to allow for one test or another test, um, your choice, whatever, the point is we don't need a standardized test to tell us where our students are. We can have those great conversations with our teachers. They're the experts and I think we need to honor their expertise and to go to the source. They know our kids better than anyone. I think considering this pandemic, which is something that no one has been through, and yet our teachers and students still with a resiliency have school every day, I think that we need to lean on them and to have those conversations with them. And I think also our building administrators can speak to that as well. And I can honestly tell you that the conversations that we've had with our parents have not been answering questions of when are we testing? They ask questions on where can my child get mental and emotional support? That's what our parents want to know. Those are the conversations they're having with our teachers. And our teachers are still reaching out to our parents. So when we talk about the standardized test and the bill and wanting to know where our kids are, we know where they are. All we have to do is ask a teacher. And we all know we've been through a horrific situation this past year. And to ask our students then to take a test, I think is putting a lot of selfishness on them because we should be more understanding to the students and having those conversations with our teachers. Thank you. Cynthia, you, you make an interesting point talking about mental and emotional support. One of the arguments I've heard against testing is that it does stress students out during a year that they're kind of already stressed. So um, Clark and Katie, you guys are our parent experts on this call. Do your kids stress about these exams or what kind of weight do students hold for standardized testing? I, uh, I have two um, sons and I called them downstairs a couple minutes ago and asked them just open-ended, hey guys, what's CMAS? And my 14 year old said, oh, it's some test the government gives. Um, his words, not mine. Um, and my uh, 11 year old says, it's the test that they give us to grade my teacher. And I feel bad. And I said, how does that feel? And he said, I feel bad because if I do bad on it, it might make my teacher or my school look bad. Um, and he loves his teacher. His words, not mine. I, I asked a very open-ended question because I had no clue. Um, my sons have no passion for testing. They wouldn't know a math test from a CMAS test from a Dibbles. So they have no idea. They just do what they're told to do when they are have, have a test put in front of them. Um, but I just wanted to report that. And then I know, um, Clark, I wanna hear your response, but Dr. Shepard, I was also interested in her response to the, the conversations from the proponents and the opponents on this. But Clark, do your kids have any other different take than my two nonchalant boys about testing? No, I, I also have boys and uh, the response is exactly the same. You know, the kindergartner doesn't have any idea um, because he's a kindergartner and he's never done this and his first year of schooling is, is this year of schooling. So, uh, you know, he just thinks school's a weird place to begin with. Um, my other son, 
um, kind of the same attitude and kind of the same idea that is, I'm stressed about it because if I don't do well, my teacher is going to get fired and I love my teacher and um, that same idea. But in terms of does he care about his score on it? He doesn't even know what it means. Um, he, he's not at all concerned with that. He just wants to make his teacher happy um, because that's, that's all that matters to an elementary school boy. Make his parents happy and make his teacher happy. Sorry, Clark, I'll jump in on that as well. Um, from both the, the CA perspective as well as the parent perspective. Um, I mean, we have seen just a tremendous amount of stress for our students. Um, obviously, we as adults have gone through a tremendous amount of stress. We're all experiencing a global pandemic. We don't know how to do this and we're all just doing the, the best that we can. Um, but we have students who have suffered tremendous loss. We have students who have uh, lost a parent. We, I had a teacher uh, relay to me the story uh, very recently about how he was calling home to uh, a student because the student hadn't been participating in class, signing on to the remote learning. Uh, when he finally got in touch with the, the student, the student, this is a 13 year old uh, boy, said that his mom had died from COVID and he was trying to take care of his siblings. This is a 13 year old who has experienced the loss of a parent and at the same time is trying to help his younger siblings just stay afloat. Um, that's a tremendous amount of, of pressure on a young child. And you know, so there's that level of pressure that kids are experiencing. Um, some haven't experienced that kind of loss, but they are experiencing the loss of, of what was normal to them, the loss of being around friends, the loss of even those who are in in-person learning, it doesn't look the same. Um, I live right across the street from our elementary school, and so I can look out on the window, and they're divided up into little blocks of spaces at recess. They can't cross over the line and, and see their friends in other classrooms. Or So there's just so much that is different for our students. And uh, my sixth grader, she's entered into sixth grade in a very unusual way. Those transition years, as a school counselor, I know those transition years are extremely important for our students emotional well-being as well as their academic well-being. She had four days of in-person learning um, at the, the, in the fall. In the end of January, when they were finally able to go back to uh, in-person learning again, uh, she was super excited. I dropped her off at school. A couple hours later, I got a phone call to pick her up that she had thrown up in school. Um, she was so anxious and so worried and so nervous that that's, you know, that's how she was experiencing um, a, going back to in-person learning and in this whole new school that she, you know, spent four days in. And, and again, not normal days, didn't know the hallways, didn't know the classrooms, barely knew the real faces of their teachers outside of a screen like this. So when we think about those emotional impacts that our students are experiencing, they're, they're very real. Um, and, and, you know, and I think when we look at, can we use a test to assess learning loss? Um, I'd actually like Dr. Lori Shepard to, to speak to that because, um, you know, I think that the, the, the CMAS in particular is not designed to give us that kind of an answer, especially in this very unstandard year that we've all experienced. Yeah, I'll jump in and, and I, I, but I don't want to leave the stress uh, issue uh, before moving on to talking about like what can and can't we measure with such an instrument. Um, we, we know that there is always stress and uh, disproportionately for some children more than others when they're facing a test. Uh, and so all, what's happening now is that this is just heightened. This is way different. We got, uh, with some things we wrote to the uh, Department of Education, the US Department of Education, uh, to get them to think about a particular um, affordance that they were willing, a, a concession they were willing to make, which is we shouldn't make anyone who's still learning remotely come into school to take the test. What the technical experts will tell you is that the you cannot validly combine the remote learning test, if you were to try to give it there and in person. So the department has said, fine, let's bring everyone in to test. That has some ramifications that they haven't thought through. And one of them is related to this issue of stress. 
imagine that for some kids, the whole meaning of school this year is come in and take a test, or when they're just newly back to in-person learning, the test is the representation of what school is supposed to be about. And that's, that's not a message we want kids to understand. Um, the fact that so many still will not be coming back to school is then what brings us to this other issue about what can the test do and what can it do. Because we will not have the same 95% participation that we had in 2019, we cannot just simply do uh, some computations and figure out what learning loss is. We can't compare schools with respect to learning loss, and we can't compare uh, 2021 to 2019 because the changes in participation rate, 60% one school, 80% another school, largely 95% back in 2019, means that those just computing the difference between the two will be more about who's missing than what amount of learning was or was not mastered. And we just don't seem to be able to have people think about this. Uh, various statisticians have jumped in with some good estimation techniques. And I could start to tell you, and your eyes would glaze over, about what we would need to do to predict from 2017 to 2019 to then get a, an equation that let us could predict from 2019 to 2021. And then if we uh, kept those things uh, proportional, we could estimate the amount of learning loss. Um, it, none of you had your eyes glaze over, but that's, uh, that's not the whole detail of what it would take. And it's not the same thing as just put those average scores in the newspaper or percent proficient in the newspaper. Uh, everyone should be fearful of what inferences will be drawn incorrectly from publishing those scores in the paper. Conversely, others are saying, no, no, I don't need it for uh, broad trends. I need it for parents. And that's when uh, Dr. Trinidad's uh, explanation is we have much closer to the child information from their teachers and from the interim assessments that are administered in nearly every district in this state, we already have that information to help parents know how their kids are doing. We don't need to give a non-representative sample of the state test to get that information. And if some parents want it, the test publisher could use an old form of the test and let the parents who want it, bring their kids into school to get that information. There's not a reason that we have to give CMAS this year. Hmm. Well, I wanna actually just point out one thing Lori said, just to remind people of context, that that's absolutely true in Denver where the only day you see a kid might be for a standardized testing day, but most of the rural school, school districts in the state have been in person for most or all the school year, including ours. So it's not to disagree with the point, it's just that context has not been factored in this discussion very much. And you know we've been we've been in school every day since um, October, and in fact, in our neighboring districts longer. And in fact, our attendance rates are higher this year than in the past, which is an interesting anomaly. Even when you account for the numbers of kids who are in quarantine because we have to quarantine cohort, cohorts when the case presents, so that that matters too. It, you know, I totally get like you don't want to bring the kid back, have his only day in school be a test. But we're talking about, you know, a few hours out of a full school year in order to try to get data. I, I, Lori, you're pointing out some really good methodological questions. Um, I'm not sure it's true. I'd like to know more. I'm not trying to take you on because this is your field that most school districts and schools in the state have good interim assessments. I think the problem is we don't have a coherent assessment system. And, and I apologize, Cynthia, I'm not willing to just defer to every teacher in every classroom in the state and say, I'm good that the kids are learning because the teachers say they are, um, because we just know that we want some ways of, of assessing at a general level whether kids are learning um, for, at a population level. Um, and, and not to say I mistrust teachers, but, but um, it doesn't add up. 
um, because we know we have schools and we know we have school systems that are failing kids. And, and to just say that every teacher knows what's learning and parents should trust it, trust but verify. Yeah, you guys all raise a lot of very interesting points. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you, Rob. And, and I would like to uh, speak to what you said about a coherent interim testing. And you're saying that there isn't coherent interim testing across the state. But then that also holds true for attendance and the way instruction has been delivered. We have not had coherent instruction programming across the state either, which then would lend itself to not needing a standardized test when not all schools have been in person such as yours. Mine has not been. And when we look at the stress issue as well, you did not address that piece. And, and I just wanna point out in NBC News, they actually pointed out that from March to October, the proportion of emergency department visits related to mental health increased 24% for children ages five to 11 and spiked 31% among adolescents aged 12 to 17 compared to those in the same period in the previous year. At my school in particular, New America School, which is 98% free and reduced lunch, we've been averaging about 60% attendance during remote teaching and learning. I recently had a student that called for mental health support last week because her younger sister committed suicide because of the stress that the pandemic has caused on her and her family. This young lady has also had to work to help support her family during this time of pandemic. So standardized testing and has not been an important factor to this family, nor to many families, when we're talking about inequitable resources during the pandemic. Many of my students have had to work jobs to help support their families. And the questions I've received as phone calls as a principal have been, where can I get rent assistance? Where can I get mental health support? Where can I get food for my family? So standardized testing to me as an administrator is not a priority. To my teachers, that is not the priority. Our focus needs to be on how are we gonna help our young people recover from a horrific pandemic that no one has ever experienced before. That is where our focus needs to be. Are our kids okay? Are our families okay? That's where our focus and our resources need to be, not on the direction of a standardized test that is not going to give us coherent information when there has been nothing coherent about this experience this past year. I'd also like to address a couple of points, but I don't know if you wanted to move on to a different question or- uh... No, Stephanie, go ahead. This is, yeah. you know, this is a really great discussion. Yeah, I appreciate it. And I think I acknowledge a lot of those mental health issues. I had my own mental health issues in the last pan uh, throughout the pandemic, but even before the pandemic, we, we acknowledge that kids were struggling with mental health well before this pandemic even started. And so I think part of the challenge is from, from a policy and advocacy research organization perspective is that we don't have any information. You talk about attendance, you talk about um, you know, kids learning online, how many, how many kids are actually sitting and watching the content online. And, and when we think about the number of kids that are actually in person, 170 districts, the commissioner reported last week are in person. Um, and so I think what we've learned is that we don't have all the answers within the education system, but we also can't make these, uh, great, these big claims about what's happening to students when we don't have basic data around engagement online. We don't have basic data around um, attendance, like simple things like that, that we should, we should know about our kids, we don't know. And I think the conversation we're having today feels really heavily focused on the impact that it has to adults. And I hear that. Um, I was a teacher, I was an educator, I had to administer those same assessments and I didn't share that in my bio piece. And that was a stressful time for me as well. But when you think about um, what we don't know right now, there's a lot more that we don't know about the content being delivered for kids. And I think this, the pivot should, the question shouldn't be, should we do standardized tests? Should, shouldn't we do it? It's a question of how can our tests be more responsive to the moment? And I think what you mentioned, Cynthia, was around social emotional learning and our tests don't account for that. So to me, I, I hear an opportunity to shift mindsets for adults 
And I also hear the opportunity here to shift mindsets for students. Um, and the question for me is, what are parents or educators telling kids about assessments that no longer is true? When we think about the high stakes piece, that's been decoupled from assessments this year. When we think about accountability, that's been decoupled from assessments. And to respond to um, Lori's point around um, the data being valid or not, I think there's an acknowledgement from folks that do the, the technical weedsy work. You have the technical advisory panel at the Department of Education saying it is going to be a challenge, but we don't want to let imperfect data be the enemy of no data. Um, and so those are just some pieces that whether you agree with me or not, I just wanted to share that perspective because it feels like I'm outnumbered in this panel. But I want to say that I'm, I respect your perspective, but also want to address where there's an opportunity for us to reframe something that I think we all have negative experiences with. Well, uh, Stephanie, I think we should model uh, what we talked about before the panel started about the tattered cover uh, folks were expecting us to be generous to each other. And so I want to do that, uh, but take on this uh, phrase you use, because I've heard it so much, that you know, bad data is better than no data is how, how it's been said to me many times in the last couple of months. So I just have to take that on because bad data can be seriously misleading data. And I've had the conversations with the technical people who are trying to um, advise CDE about like, how could we make sense of it? And you have to understand that if you don't have representative data, then what the statisticians will try to do is use socioeconomic characteristics like free and reduced lunch and other group membership designations to try to adjust the numbers to be more representative or more like the data that we're trying to compare it to from another school or from 2019. Every time people say learning loss, they're imagining that we would uh, try to say from 2019 data uh, where kids should be and then uh, assess a difference. And that's what people are meaning when they say learning loss. And you have to hear me when I say that those statistical adjustments will be no better than if we got all the I-ready data from those districts and did a little study, got all the NWE, NWEA data from another several districts widely used in Colorado and did those comparisons and see whether across many of those comparisons, we could with more complete data, still just estimate the answer to your question. And so the reason I'm so adamant is that I, drilling down to very fine detail, can assure you how accurate or inaccurate the data will be. And I have to say, it's not worth it. Now put the stress that every other year we live with, right? I'm a strong, strong advocate for the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And, th and they get pushed back every time they try to go into schools and do data collection. And my stance is the data is worth it. It's worth the time from instruction. It's worth some of the kids feeling stressful. What I'm telling you now is it's not worth it. The stress is greater and the inaccuracy is severe. We have a question from the audience that sort of um, speaks to this conversation that we're having. It seems like we are using the same tool for different purposes, measuring learning loss, accountability, comparable data, resource allocation, all those things. Uh, our question from the audience is, how can the education ecosystem become more aligned in the value of understanding what kids know still need, and still need to learn versus trying to come to an agreement on a tool? Any thoughts there? Well, I'd, I'd like to tie it all together with that. Um, you know, when Dr. Trinidad Shaheen said that it's ask a teacher, we're there. I can tell you as a teacher, I am there. And, you know, for, for Mr. Stein to say that, you know, we have to trust but verify, 
I think that implies that his teachers were somehow going to lie about how well a student's doing um, and say, oh, they're, they're doing great, even if they're not. Um, and I know as a teacher and as a parent, that's, that's not what teachers do. Um, there's no benefit in me making up how well a student's doing um, if they're not really. And so to use a standardized test to tell us that doesn't tell us nearly as much, especially in this type of scenario, whereas Dr. Shepard said, we don't have all the data. It's not good data. It's not telling a true story. And so for us to not go to the teachers and say, what, what do you have? Right? Teachers have lots of different types of formative assessments. We, we have papers, we have exams, we have discussions, we have all sorts of different data points that we can point to and say, this is how a student is doing. And I, I did see somebody also asked in the chat about standardized testing outside of COVID. And that's certainly a huge question. Again, getting back to this idea of bad data of how do we know it's accurate? How do we know it's actually telling us something? And uh, for whatever reason, you know, as we take tests online and kids don't understand how to do that, or because it's so high stakes and they're stressed out, or because we've removed the high stakes and now they don't care and they just fill in C for everything. It, it's such an uncontrollable environment that the data can be all over the place. Uh, my third grader, uh, took one of his iReady tests and it said he had a terrible vocabulary and we, along with the teacher, immediately just disregarded that because we knew it wasn't true. He had a bad test, but it wasn't an accurate reflection of his learning. And I, I think that's where it comes back to what Dr. Trinidad Shaheen said is, it's ask the teachers, they know. And teachers aren't afraid to tell you if a kid's not doing well. They will absolutely tell you no, he's not where he needs to be in writing. No, he's not where he needs to be in math. They're not gonna hold that back from that perspective. And that's, no, I, I still think there's a reason to have some testing. And I, I think it's pointed out by, you know, if, if for no other reason than to show people that we're not afraid of it, um, but it, it doesn't tell the whole story. And if you go to the teachers, they're the experts. They know what they're talking about. I, I do think that's one of the worries is that, um, and, and I think there's a lot, a, a lot of um, people with good intentions around the, the why of giving the assessment this year and, and how it would be used and what it would be used for. But there also is, as Dr. Shepard pointed out, a deep concern about the misuse of the data. Um, and, and that can certainly happen. I think you know, one of the things we want to be thoughtful about is, is how are we painting that, that full picture? Um, as Stephanie pointed out, we do actually have a lot of information. We need to look at all of that information. We do have attendance data, and it is telling us a story. Um, and districts are going, going through that data, I can assure you of that, on, the day, on a daily basis. My husband is a middle school assistant principal, and he makes calls every single day to families who are not connecting to school to figure out what's happening, what supports do they need, what resources. So we have things like attendance data. We also should be talking to students. Um, there are some states that are doing some re really innovative things. Um, Oregon is one of those states where they're putting out a statewide uh, survey to students specifically asking students about their learning, about their needs, about the, their academic needs, their social, emotional, their mental health needs. Um, there are a lot of things that, you know, we can be pulling together. Um, again, we're, we are not going to have one single thing that is going to tell us the picture of what happened to our students, what happened to our educators, what happened to our public school system during COVID. That is not going to come from a single source place, whether it be a standardized assessment, whether, I mean, it is going to require a multitude of things coming together um, for us to, to look at that. Um, and so I, I, I fear that we are going to put so much onto one thing that, that and we're going to say that's going to, you know, tell us the full picture of this moment in time. And that would be, in, in my opinion, the worst thing that we could do. Can I go back and just ask Clark a question? I, I don't mean to imply, like trust but verify. I feel like I've made a lot of decisions over the past year that I don't trust. 
fully myself, I'd like to verify I'm on the right track. As a teacher, when you say there's some kinds of testing you'd like to see, because it might verify your hunches about how your kids are doing or confirm that you need to maybe put more emphasis in another area. That's what I mean. What kind of like, what kind of verification would you like from a testing system as a teacher that would support your efforts, not what Amy's describing, you know, accountability, take it off the table. Yeah, and I and I think that's on one hand I want the testing uh, or something so I have some results that tell me what I know. A lot of those as a high school teacher I can use on my own and I can come up with and create my formative assessments. And and I think that's one of the key. And Dr. Shepard mentioned it before is the idea of formative assessments. And I wish that we had more formative assessments. And for those who aren't familiar, those are the assessments where we find out what students know in order to help us teach them. And if, if CMAS were that, which is what it was originally intended to be and tell us what we know, that would be fantastic. But as I said, as a high school teacher, I can make a lot of those in my content area to tell me what I need to know. The state social studies test doesn't tell me anything of any importance, um, especially for high school students who generally blow it off. Um, but you know, my sons take iReady assessments and they're not perfect, they're, they're, but they give me an idea and they give their teacher an idea um, and then we can discuss it. I, for me as a teacher, one of the bigger things that I see of why we need to take the test is because there's so many people out there who think that we're bad at our jobs and we're just lazy and we don't wanna be held accountable. And I wanna have the test so I can show them, no, I'm not afraid of a test. It's just a waste of time. But if you want us to take it, we'll take it. Because otherwise, when we fight against it tooth and nail as teachers, it gives the other side ammunition to talk about how we're, we, we just want our summers off and we just wanna um, not ever be held accountable for it. So I'm fine with it in the sense that I don't mind being held accountable because I know I'm good at what I do. But um, in terms of what I can gain from it, we already have oodles and oodles of tools um, at our service, at least where I teach, um, to, to find out what students know and their, their scores going back on all sorts of different things and, and talking to other teachers, talking to the teacher they had the year before. What do they know? What do they need to work on? I will say I, I have I, I just a response. I would Go. like to say something, sorry. I would like to say something to Clark and Amy's point, um, which were very good points. Amy, you spoke about um, the opportunities to survey families and to question and to find out what they need. Clark pointed out of having tools, right? Formative assessments that right there in the moment, what do kids know? We have an opportunity to do things better than we used to do. And instead of relying on what piece of the standardized test are we going to give? This is an opportunity because of the pandemic, because of having this time, this is an opportunity for us to do just what Amy and Clark said is, let's do it, let's do something better. Let's find out from our parents. How often are we equitable in finding out what our black and Latino families are needing to create better systems that are equitable and not an oppressive system that we've been working in for hundreds of years. We have an opportunity right now to say, you know what, that's not working. Let's do something and let's do it better. Let's have those formative assessments and better tools for the teachers in the classroom. They're the experts. They should be the ones to design it. They're the ones that should create that because they are the ones that are gonna be on the ground with the kids every day. And so I think that the expertise again, and I go back to it, is the teachers. They are the experts. And we need to talk to all of our families, not just some of our families. Our black and Latino families need to have their voices heard on what they want for their kids. How often are they asked in all their many languages what they want for their kids? We need to do it better and we have an opportunity right now to do things better than we have been. Stephanie, did you have a response? Thank you, I think I think it was to, to the initial question but also after having heard other folks share, I just also in the spirit of healthy debate, you know, in terms of the, the local assessments piece, I mean, that would be wonderful if from a statewide perspective, we could see all those formative, you know, assessments and all those pieces. Part of what makes it challenging is that local districts and local assessments look vastly different. 
So when I think when we're talking to legislators, which is you know, predominantly the, the work of the children's campaign, how do we, we make sense of all of the things that you all are sharing to legislators who are making budgetary decisions, who are getting stimulus money from the federal government to support schools and districts that need help the most? And so I'm not disagreeing with you all in, in, in the, the load that educators carry and the professionals that they are, but I do think from a statewide perspective, it would be really challenging to say, this is the state of our, all our schools across the, the across all districts without having a summative uh, statewide assessment. And so I think, again, where I see the opportunity is the, the reframe. I think this time has shown us that there are districts um, that are doing incredible work. I think somebody in the chat mentioned the school, the school accountability pilots where some, some school districts are doing innovative things with mental health. They're doing um, innovative things with project-based learning. Um, and I think the other thing that this pandemic has shown us is that educators and students and parents are all um, really strong and smart and resilient. And how can we paint a picture of what that looks like with the standardized component just being one thing, just that? And I think, you know, uh, Dr. Shepard, when you talk about the results, I think there's an awareness that the results um, are going to be prefaced with being problematic or being prefaced with like these are not the end all be all results and there are smart people that are thinking through what are the ramifications of communicating the results at this level and i think there's thoughtful people people that want to be honest about what our education education system is and isn't doing um so i really appreciate all the great thinking but would encourage this group to think about what can we do with local assessment and how can we ensure that local assessment is part of the picture around summative assessment and all of the pieces that we we all care about. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to say that there are. Um, did you want to close up? Uh, are you running out of time? We are running slim on time, so I wanted to make sure that we talk about the future. I think Stephanie brings up a really good point. Like, uh, obviously, COVID nineteen has created a unique situation this year, but it's obviously ignited larger and broader conversations about standardized testing, its role and its value. So I would open this to to any of the panelists. How, if at all, do you hope CMAS or standardized testing changes or remains the same going forward um, now that we're living in sort of a new normal? Um, well, I, I just wanted to first say to Stephanie that um, you identified several different purposes, including uh, funding allocation. And at this time, I would say that um, we can come up with indices of uh, extended absences COVID impact, health statistics, and other um, achievement indicators from the school from 2019 that could be more accurate for immediate resource allocation. For the future, um, I, I think there's been a general unhappiness with standardized testing for, for a century, <laughs> but more emphatically, uh, since the uh, overreach of No Child Left Behind, the more recent legislation that is governing us now with CMAS uh, was a slight uh, easing up, at least that's what they intended, that's what the narrative was in, um, in Congress when uh, the most recent legislation was passed that will be reauthorized in a couple of years, perhaps, if this administration cares about it. And there's also more flexibility in the law that, that I think should allow people to do less of what has been happening in the past and look for some remedies, uh, including things that you mentioned, like project-based learning and other ways of demonstrating excellence that doesn't require uniformity. The requirement right now for uniformity is uh, fitting everything into so narrow a box that we can show you that we're limiting the representation of the content domains. So we're doing less than what we hoped for for everyone. Um, and that's, that's the uh, dumbing down effects of standardized testing that we need to change in the future. Um, so I, and I think that's something that maybe uh, Rob and I agree about. Let me, rather than looking forward, I wanna look back um, just to make a point about what I hope the future can look like. I am not at all claiming that standardized testing is the end all be all. It should be human, very limited in its use. Um, I attended 
Denver's historically black high school. And almost 30 years later, I became principal of that high school. And I was hired to reopen the school that had been closed because it was failing its students. And when I looked at the data, it was clear to me that that school was failing its students. And we, it, it, to, to not use data, to not use some testing to say, wow, we have to do better. And then to monitor over time, are we actually serving these kids? Or are we continuing to inflict the same injustice on them that has been inflicted on them generationally would be negligent. And so not, you know, just throwing out all data or all quote standardized testing, you know, I like would be a big mistake. And Cynthia, you and I are so aligned in values, but to say that there's no use of data to try to close these kind of inequities that you're describing so passionately, and I totally agree with you, we have to have the data and it's maybe methodologically um, impossible right now. Lori's pointing out some reasons it might be, but we should be using not bad data, but the best available data to try to find out, are we serving our kids? Not to mistrust teachers, but we have to know. Yeah, and I think that's and, a great- You know, to um, that point, Rob. Go ahead, Cynthia, I'll go after you. Oh. And Rob, you know, I know that I did not say like throw out all data. What I did say is that the best data we can actually have is the data that our teachers have every day. Our teachers are with those students every day. Our teachers are planning and executing phenomenal lessons. They're there to support our kids. They are working past hours even online to make sure that our kids are getting what they need. And so we do need data, but our teachers are the experts that are giving us that data right now. Standardized testing, um, we don't need it. We don't need it now during a pandemic where our, first of all, our enrollment is at a decline as well. Governor Polis spoke to that in August. He pointed out that the enrollment across the state of Colorado was down by 1,660 students less than the year before, just in Aurora alone. And so that tells us kids are not engaging in school. If they're not engaging in school, then how can we then say they need to also take a standardized test? However, the students that are engaging with school, our experts, the teachers, they're gathering that data and they're gathering it every day. And I think in looking to the future, we need to do not do school to our parents and many of our parents of color, black and Latino parents, we're, we've been doing school to them. We make policies and we make planning and we create standardized tests and we do school to them, but we're not doing school with them. And in order to do it with them, we have to have those conversations with them, regardless of linguistic diversity, we need to make it happen so that we know what our parents want for their kids. One point that's been raised in the chat, and Amy, maybe you can speak to this, is that um, the opt-out rate this year. Does anybody know what the expectation is there, um, what that may look like, and how that may affect results? Well, I think, I mean, I, I do think we are seeing, it, it varies across the state, but we are seeing uh, districts with significantly higher opt-out rates than they have had in previous years. And as Dr. Shepard pointed out, that, that, that participation rate will impact the, the usage of those uh, results and how they're used, how they're interpreted, and how they can and should be used to, uh, to again, to look back. Um, so we have, to, we have to think about that. I also think that um, we need to look at why parents are opting out. Why are they uh, making that choice and that decision uh, for their individual student? Because that is an individual choice that a family makes for their child. Um, for many of them, it's because you know they have made that individual choice this year to be in full remote learning for their child. They don't want to have to come into the school building just to take a standardized test. For others, it's because they know that their child is under extreme uh, pressure or stress and they don't want to do it. For others, it may be for a, a different reason, but I think it goes back to what uh, Dr. Trinidad Sheehan was saying. We need to be hearing from families, from parents. We need um, for parents to help us understand. We have a decade plus, and you know, I'm sure Dr. Shepard Shepherd could expound on this, a decade plus of uh, testing data that has told us a picture that is 
painted a picture of what's happening for in our schools for our students and I would um, I would like to to you know talk with Dr. Stein about um, you know yes we are seeing inequities um, through that testing data for our students but what have what is it is it the schools that are failing our kids or is it a system that is failing our students because we are not seeing resources coming to those schools and those um, students who need it most. Um, so I think we have to look systemically. We have we all know that we um, that our school system um, is is our public school system in America um, is is grounded in racist roots. We need to look at that. We need to find a way to figure out how we are serving our students of color and what experiences they are having in our public schools. Um, again, I think that yes, we need data. I, as we as we talk about going forward, um, I would say I, I hope that this is an opportunity for us to look at the role of assessment within the larger system because I do think we have to look systemically at the full system and how we are serving students, how we are serving families, and what is the system's role in shifting those inequities, those gaps that exist because those gaps um, have not shrunk in the last you know, decade plus that um, we've been giving, I mean, it's been more than a decade, but uh, you know, that we've been utilizing these assessments for the purposes of grading, rating, labeling students and schools. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that we will use this opportunity to do better by our students, by our educators, by our communities, uh, going back to normal, would be a, a major disservice to um, everyone who accesses our public school system. I'd, I'd just like to jump in for, as per 1161, the, you know, the bill that we talked about at the beginning, um, it does also make it allowable for parents to opt in. So yes, there is the opt out, mm -hmm. which has always been an option for, for parents, but because the test would be every other grade. So for example, third, fifth, seventh, taking ELA, fourth, sixth, eighth, taking math, Parents can opt into taking both, so I wanted to uh, I wanted to share that there's that there's that side as well. Um, and in terms of what we hope for for assessment in the future, I think you all have articulated what needs to change and what needs to shift and what's possible when we think about assessment. When I think about the type of assessments I was subjected to I was in high school and middle school, it looked very similar. And I think to your point, Amy, they need to shift and they need to change. But we do need to understand how all kids are doing. The claims that you're making about systems not serving our students well. You can make that claim because we have data that tells us the, the disaggregated data that tells us how those kids are doing. So in, in my mind, the, the future of assessments is competency-based, project-based, uh, tells us what kids, what's possible for kids. And you know, I, I hope we can get rid of this label of you either fail or pass when that's not how it works for us as adults in our work. We either have areas where we need to do better and have constructive criticism, or there are areas where we excel. And so I think to your point around what we need to do better, I think we need to reframe how we talk about education, but also how we talk about assessment. And I think the purpose should be educational census as opposed to educational assessment. Um, so it's our job as adults, I think, to tell kids that failing is not, is not the term that we should be using. It's an opportunity to learn and it's part of what education is. Um, so I appreciate all the perspectives, but also um, I agree that I think we need to um, imagine something that's a little bit better and different that also provides us with the data that tells us what our systems are and aren't doing in order to make those claims around systemic racism. Awesome. Can I just add yeah. one thing as a... Sure, go Katie. All I'm going to say after all this conversation about testing, I just got to ask, what are we testing for? Because right now I've got a ninth grader who could really use some help with math um, to, for, for what he's lost or wasn't able to gain this year. So in the short term, um, I'm just looking for some some assessment measures to figure out, well, how can I help my kiddo from the ninth grade to the 10th grade have the best experience possible? And for my fifth, you only get to be in fifth grade once. Um, so I love, we're talking about all this testing and I just wanna remind us who's being tested and what we're being tested for. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. We are coming up against the uh, the hour, but we have some great questions from the audience. So if you guys don't mind going a couple minutes over, I have a couple I would like to ask. Um, and if anybody needs to hop off, that's okay as well. One of our audience members asked, 
thinking ahead, how is SB 19-204, the public school local accountability systems, how is that helping to inform ongoing conversations about the design of an assessment paradigm in Colorado that meets the needs of all stakeholders, including students, families, administrators, advocates, all those people? Anyone have thoughts? I'm happy to take the question and if I don't answer it, uh, I, I'll, I'll be happy to try again. I think the intention behind that uh, program and behind that bill was to uh, provide districts the opportunity to innovate when it comes to accountability. So when, when folks in this conversation talk about accountability and the purpose of accountability, um, I, that bill provided local districts with the opportunity to share where they're innovating in terms of social emotional learning, in terms of uh, project-based learning, competency-based learning, all these different uh, uh, pieces. And so I believe it's uh, nine districts across the state that are participating in that pilot. And I think the hope is that um, where you can take lessons learned uh, for things that are working within those pilots to share for the larger accountability conversation that I foresee we will have. Um, but I think that's the intention behind uh, 204. Awesome. Someone else asked, um, are districts sharing or willing to share their formative assessment data, such as iReady and WEA or others? Um, I know from my personal experience asked, uh, writing a story recently about um, learning loss in the time of COVID that, you know, some of that data needs to be um, asked for core and others is publicly available in uh, Board of Education meetings. So is that is there a standard for releasing that information across the state? Um, I can uh, answer. I saw when Dan asked that question, um, and I think he asked it uh, in response to my suggestion that we could do research studies to examine the extent of learning loss using those data, but it would require that we ask for use of the data. Uh, in California, and this as an aside, let me uh, remind people that 10 states are still requesting of the Department of Education nationally that they be allowed to not test. So it's not, I don't know if they will be allowed or not, but California is one of the states and they have, they have asked all of their districts to provide alternative data um, through uh, the kinds of things with their diagnostic assessments, they call them, um, that are given in each district instead of statewide. So um, it's possible, but of course, uh, Van, you'd have, to, you'd have to ask the districts, or you could work with the test publishers uh, if what you're trying to assess is compared to 2019. Um, each of the districts have that capability as well. I will just add, I do, I think that was part of a, a conversation we were be beginning to explore with districts. I would say traditionally districts haven't um, shared that district, that data, the interim assessment data broadly because it, it there wasn't, you know, it wasn't used for that purpose. We had the statewide uh, assessment data, but um, we were beginning to talk and districts were, you know, again, we hadn't gone deep with that, but uh, we're saying they, there would be a willingness to share that data. Um, as you pointed out, Tiny, it is shared by districts in different ways. Of course, it's always shared with uh, parents. I, as a parent, get it twice a year for my uh, students. But many share it at the school board level. Many share it with the Colorado Department of Education, either through their UIP process. Um, some utilize that uh, interim data when they're going for a request for reconsideration on their uh, school rating. So there's lots of ways that that data is shared by districts, um, but it's not uniform at this point. I think, again, we were beginning to go down that road to see if there was a way to uh, do that statewide, but that just never came to be because of the, the direction the conversation's headed. Okay, fantastic. Does anyone else have any parting thoughts for our audience on standardized testing in the past, present, or future? We've had such a really compelling discussion here today, and this is a conversation that I know will not be complete once COVID runs its course. Um, I was going to add in, because uh, Stephanie's mentioned it a couple of different times, about um, just kind of these new ways of teaching students and how education is so different today than it was 
20 years ago, 30 years ago, whenever, and with project-based learning and all of the technology that we have at our fingertips. And I think one of the things that has become really apparent with our with project-based learning, with the types of learning that we're doing today in education is it doesn't fit neatly into a standardized test. And one of the things that we see is we see a disconnect today in schools of what is best practice for teachers to be doing and how we're told to instruct our students compared to what is being tested. And I, I don't know what the answer is, but the old way of standardized tests and these, even though they're new tests, they're the same as they've always been, don't meet our needs for the data and we're going to get inherently bad data because it's not in line with what and the way that we are teaching, right? The standardized tests can tell us what students are able to memorize and what they know. And school today is so much more about thinking and critically thinking. And when we do those in projects and we change the way we teach and the standardized test doesn't change with it, that creates a major problem, especially for teachers when we say, well, this is what we're being told, how we're being told to teach. This is the best way to teach, but your job depends on how students do on this test. And it, it creates a dichotomy in public education that only serves to hurt the students. And, and I think that's, that's what I would like to see is, I, I think we need data. I think we need information but it, it going forward, it's got to be done in a way that meets the way that we're teaching students because the way that we're teaching students and the old way of testing does not add up. Yeah, I'd like to second oh, that. Go ahead, Doug. I'll go after you. Well, I, I, just, I just wanted to say, uh, if people are interested, uh, the New York Performance Standards Consortium was started over 20 years ago and uh, it is all based on project-based learning. And those schools participating in that consortium have for all these uh, many, many years had an exemption from the New York Regents exam. And uh, they do uh, performance-based assessments. They do um, exhibitions for their graduation from high school. Uh, and uh, the, the, the depth of that learning is so different from what we can possibly assess with a standardized test. I, I can tell you that the problem with standardized tests is that we have to make them curriculum neutral. We have to make them generic. We purposely take meaning that is unique to individual students' experiences out of the test because that would favor one group of students over another group of students. But that's the very attribute that makes it deadening. Uh, and so it, and it is when then you teach to that because there's so much pressure on those tests and those metrics, then you're teaching to that narrow, generic, uh, meaning taken out of thing. Yes, and I was just going to add um, that I, I also have a hope that, you know, I know we've spent a lot of time talking about how we measure the impacts on learning, um, you know, from, during this pandemic time, and, and primarily from a, a, a pejorative position, you know, framing it as learning loss. Um, I also think we need to be paying attention to what our students have learned um, throughout this time, and how do we take that, those learnings that our students have had and, and build off of those. Um, our students have learned things, um, you know, so, some in, in, a, in a very hard way um, that we can't, you know, that they wouldn't have learned otherwise. But um, I can say, you know, my eight-year-old, way more technologically savvy than I am <laughs> right now. She, could, she can handle the Google suite like that. And, you know, she's doing, popping off. Google slide presentations and you know doing all these things that I have no idea how to do. But also I think we have to look from that social emotional side and this is you know coming from my school counselor side, the skills they have learned around resiliency and coping. Um, and, and I think we need to, you know, I just I don't want that to get lost in the whole conversation when we only look at what has gone 
wrong for our students, we should also look at what has gone well and what have they learned. Um, our students are listening to how we talk about them, how we talk about this moment right now. And I want to make sure we continue to talk about the things they have done well and the things that they are learning because they hear that and they need to hear that. They have shown tremendous courage in a, in a moment in time that, that has been hard for all of us. So I just wanted to be sure to lift that up as well. Awesome. Yes. I like ending on a positive and I note. I think too, as a, yeah, a, a, just a closing thought is that, yes, exactly that, Amy. And, and we need to also, you know, we need to be more focused on the positives our kids have learned. We need to be more focused on helping them mentally, emotionally, and physically transition back into school and to do things better. That's where our focus needs to be, not on a standardized test, but focus on them being successful mentally, emotionally, and physically. Well, thank you guys so much for joining our conversation. Can I say just oh, one yeah, more thing? absolutely. I, yeah, sure. I just want I just want to uh, appreciate you all for creating the the space for not so much debate but more discourse and dialogue because it feels like uh, this is modeling behavior that I think should be happening at, at various levels and so I really appreciate it and I also just want to acknowledge uh, you all as parents and educators um, you're you're doing superhero work during a very incredible and difficult time and so just want to appreciate you all and uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, engage in the conversation with you all and. Um, you're doing the best you can. So thanks for hosting the space and I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, again, this was a, such an inspiring conversation and thank you guys so much. I can't wait to talk more with you on the subject. Now I'm going to toss it to the um, Alan Frost, who is with Tattered Cover, co-owner, to say a few parting words. Honey, thank you very much. And to everyone attending this, thank you so much. Our panel is fantastic. Thank you for your time, for your candor on a very difficult topic. Um, Stephanie, as you acknowledge, this Tattered Cover Presents series is a way for Tattered Cover to convene on issues of importance to our customers, to our friends, to our colleagues. Uh, as you said, not to persuade, but to inform, to engage on issues, uh, and to create a safe space for the discourse that is so critical in this, uh, this very difficult time. Um, Mary will be sending out a reading list uh, for resources to follow up on so that people can educate themselves more directly on this issue, and there'll be several more Tatter Cover presents uh, presentations coming up. Please uh, stay tuned to our social media and our website at tatteredcover.com in order to engage further on these topics. Uh, again, thank you for being here uh, th this afternoon. Uh, stay warm, stay safe. And I want to uh, turn it over to Mary Wilson from A Plus Colorado. Hey, uh, just to echo everyone else, um, just wanted to thank you for coming. Um, this is a really important conversation. Uh, a Plus Colorado has been involved with this conversation along with everyone on this panel that are engaged in this work. Um, and it's, it's, it's been brought to light because of COVID. However, that these conversations um, are so important no matter the year and this COVID has kind of like so much else accentuated um, this issue. So thank you for being here. Um, I did wanna tell you a little bit about A+. Uh, we helped kind of organize this event. Uh, we're a nonprofit research and advocacy group. Um, we're an action think tank. Uh, here in Colorado committed to that every child in Colorado can access an excellent education. Uh, we don't put out papers, analysis, reports, and more about education in Colorado. I'm putting the link here um, so you can sign up for our newsletter, which we send out um, all of that info so you can stay in tune. And then also, as um, Alan said, we put together a reading list uh, about this issue, which is kind of showing all sides of the spectrum. And so I will be sending that out so you can kind of dig in deeper. Um, and then also Tini's, um, like, you know, her reporting is just amazing on this. Um, Chalkbeat also does a lot of reporting on this. Um, but I know that um, Tini was hired to do marijuana reporting and during the pandemic just jumped into education. So we're really happy she was here and moderating and, and doing this in real work. So uh, awesome. So I, I, that's it. Um, we, we're excited to kind of connect with all of you guys about this offline. And uh, thank you so much.